Okay, so still uh, talking about executive power under Article 2 and continuing on with finishing up some nuances, some sub-issues under executive power. So we talked in the last video about the president's power to appoint and remove people from office. Uh, now we have to talk about two things on this video. One is executive privilege and the other is executive immunity. Uh, the first thing that I note on the slide here is not to confuse the two. Um, there are two clauses in the Constitution called Privileges and Immunities Clause, which have absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about here. Um, so, <clears throat> and what, well, you know, we'll talk more about those in, in the future. Um, uh, but I oftentimes see students talk about privilege when they mean immunity, or talk about immunity when they mean privilege. So let's separate those out. Privilege has to do with keeping secrets, right? Uh, if I claim privilege, I mean, you'll know this from being an attorney, right? If you invoke attorney-client privilege, that means that you're not going to disclose information uh, that you feel that you shouldn't have to disclose uh, because that information is secret. It's between you and your client. So, the, uh, so, so privilege comes up when the issue and the fact pattern is whether the president or, or vice president has to disclose certain information. This has been all over the news lately, you know, the last couple of years. <coughs> um, and frankly, uh, we've made a little bit of a hash out of this, so we'll try to get through it. But issue spotting wise, when the issue is whether, right, when the question is whether the president or vice president can withhold information, you're being tested on privilege. Immunity is a different issue. There, the question is whether the president can be, or vice president, can be held liable, um, right, uh, personally for what they do uh, in office. And also, we'll briefly touch on the question whether the president can be charged with a crime, right? So immunity is different from privilege. Again, privilege is I want to keep something a secret. Immunity is you can't sue me or you can't charge me with a crime, right? So separate those out. <clears throat> Let's talk first about privilege. Um, there are basically a couple cases under each one of these right uh, issues that you want to know. Uh, privilege. The leading case is the Nixon case, right? Uh, uh, Nixon versus United States, um, or United States versus Nixon. I can't remember which one, uh, which way it goes. Um, but we're talking here about President Nixon, not the Judge Nixon case that we did under the political question doctrine. Um, President Nixon during the Watergate scandal uh, claimed executive privilege, right? Uh, it came out in a Senate hearing that there were tapes of Oval Office um, uh, communications. Uh, and, of course, some of those communications were very incriminating to uh, President Nixon, uh, and Nixon uh, claimed executive privilege. So, so first of all, issue spotting there, right, you got to say, what, which one is this, immunity or privilege? Well, if he's saying, I don't want to turn the information over, right, that is an assertion of privilege. Um, okay. Um, in the Nixon case, uh, the... Uh, the Supreme Court held that there is such a thing as executive privilege. Um, but there are some rules here, right, about the, the scope of that. We should note that the Constitution itself says nothing, right, Article 2 says nothing about anything called executive privilege, right? But the court, basically as a policy matter, said, has said that if the president can't get frank advice from advisors, right, and that would include even, even people possibly outside of the government, um, then we're in bad shape, right? The president needs to be able to get advice. First of all, there's national security issues, there's classification issues, right? But even beyond that, there's this issue of the president needing to get advice. We want people around the president who will be honest with the president, will drop the F-bomb if they need to, right? And, uh, and when we want to make sure that those people don't think that, uh, you know, anything that they tell the president could wind up on the front page of the Washington Post or the New York Times the next morning, right? The only way you're going to get frank, honest discussion, right, and advice um, to the president is to have this thing called executive privilege, so says the Supreme Court. <clears throat> now let's talk about how this is supposed to work. The privilege uh, belongs to the president, and the court has also said the vice president, those two people, right? So. Theoretically, under the current law, uh, it should be the president or vice president who invokes the privilege. Now, this is a rule that is being broken, uh, or that has been broken repeatedly over the last couple of years, where people who were not the president or vice president were invoking executive privilege because theoretically the president might want to. 
That's not the way it's supposed to work. That's not the way you'd approach this on an exam. If the, if the if privilege is not invoked by the president or the vice president, right, or, or at least somebody, right, who's speaking for the president or vice president, uh, then it is not validly invoked. Um, next, what's the scope of it? <coughs> so that's, who's, who, that's who invokes it. The scope of it. The uh, privilege protects um, information, again, that, is, that involves national security, obviously that involves classified information, or that involves uh, advice, right, uh, conversations with the president or vice president in which policy type of advice is given, right? So <clears throat> that privilege is likely to yield if it's not policy, national policy, right, that, that the two people are talking about. If they're talking about committing a crime or some other corrupt um, endeavor, right, that, and it's very questionable whether that would be covered. Well, it probably would not be covered under executive privilege. Now, <clears throat> Two cases to look at, the Nixon case and the Cheney case, right, from your reading. In the Nixon case, the court says that although there is an executive privilege, the privilege must yield in a criminal prosecution where people are defending themselves. That was good. That's what was going on in the Nixon case. There were actually people who were charged with crimes, right, related to the Watergate break-in and scandal, and they, of course, like most defendants, were pointing up, right, when you when get involved in an in organized crime like that or a scandal like that. It's the low-level people who usually get nabbed first, and the, uh, one of the ways they defend themselves is to point upwards, right? So don't, it's not me, it was somebody above me. Um, so that's what was going on, right? We had defendants in these cases claiming that they needed, right, uh, this, the, the tapes and the information and the records right, from the Nixon administration, they needed those, that information to defend themselves in a criminal case. The court said when that is the issue, so this is, look at this as balancing, right? Remember that from the Quinnipiac article, uh, this one? <coughs> um, yeah, this is a balancing test. The court says, look, when you're balancing the need of a criminal defendant, right, who's defending themselves and their freedom, right, against the president's need to keep information secret, in that case, the need for the information outweighs the president's, right, executive privilege. So the way you apply this on an exam, if it's a criminal case, a court's likely to say that the president's likely to say, right, that the pre president's privilege must yield to um, the need for the information. Now contrast that with the Cheney case. In the Cheney case, it was an environmental uh, group or groups that were trying to get information about the vice president. That was the, the Dick Cheney was the vice president to George W. Bush. He was put in charge of national energy policy. Um, he had meetings uh, with people, uh, industry leaders, about national energy policy, and of course the strong suspicion was, among environmental groups, that the only people at the table were oil executives. Um, so these uh, environmental groups, they wanted uh, the information about who was at the meeting, what was said at the meeting, right, I want the, the attendance roster and I want the minutes and all, anything else I can get. Um, Contrast that with the Nixon case. The Nixon case involved people defending themselves in criminal right prosecutions. In the Cheney case, it's a bunch of uh, activists right who want the information in the context of civil litigation. Right there, it's a civil case. Nobody is defending them, their their lives. In the Cheney case, the court said no. Uh, this is, this information is privileged, and the uh, right in this case, the president's need and vice president's need for Frank. Um, discussion and advice that outweighs the need of the activists right to get this information so this is actually boils down to pretty simple right when you see this on an exam is it a criminal case in which right the information is sought or is it a civil case in which the information is sought if it's a criminal case a court's likely to say that the president's uh, right a privilege gives way and if it's a civil case the uh, court is likely to say the opposite now Immunity. <clears throat> Here too, you need to know basically two cases. Um, one is the, uh, another right Nixon case, um, and uh, and then there's the Clinton versus Jones case. So um, let's start with the general proposition that uh, the president has to be immune from liability, from personal liability for things that the president does in office. Um, this, uh, if, if that were not so, nobody would run for president, right? Because every, virtually everything the president does will hurt somebody and will anger somebody. <clears throat> so the general rule is the president is absolutely immune, let's get this straight, absolutely immune 
from personal liability, right, personal liability, right, from their own bank account, their own pocket, uh, for any act that is even arguably within the scope of the president's official duties as president. And that includes politics, right? The president is a politician. The president is going to say political things. So if what the president did has anything at all, and, the, and we're talking very broad coverage here, anything at all to do with the president being president, and that includes being a politician, um, then the president is absolutely immune from liability, right, for whatever that is. The only time you're going to get the president on the hook uh, personally is when the president does something that has absolutely nothing to do with being president, right? So in the Nixon case, the court says absolute immunity for anything within the scope of being president. The Clinton versus Jones case, right, is the case where the court says there are limits to this. Bill Clinton was accused of right, sexually harassing somebody while he was governor of uh, Arkansas. He was accused of of bringing Paula, right, having his security detail bring Paula Jones up to his suite in a hotel. He was accused at that point, I'll let you look it up, of doing very lewd things um, and sexually harassing her. First of all, he wasn't president yet, and second of all, even if he had been president, sexually harassing somebody has absolutely nothing to do, right, with the official duties of being president or being a politician. Now, so, so that's, that's basically it with, uh, in terms of immunity, right? The president's absolutely immune for anything right, the president does within the scope of the presidency or, or politics generally. It's not immune for something that has absolutely nothing to do right, with being president. Now, <clears throat> um, as to criminal liability, I will not test you on this, but since it's out there, a quick note, there is no Supreme Court guidance on whether the president can be charged with a crime. Uh, this president is claiming complete immunity, not only from being charged, but also even being investigated. Um, I don't know if a court would go that far. What we're dealing with right now is the Department of Justice, right, has internal memos, right, two, uh, one issued in the Nixon era and one in the Clinton era, here we go again, right, uh, in, in which the Department of Justice, right, uh, has developed uh, an opinion, it's an, in, again, an internal opinion from what, something called the OLC, Office of Legal Counsel within the Department of Justice, um, that is the Department of Justice policy not to uh, indict a sitting president because that would unduly interfere with the president's role right, as the chief executive under Article 2. So that's where that stands now is that we have a policy from the Department of Justice. We do not have court opinions on that. Okay, that's privilege and immunity. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's pretty much a wrap on uh, Article 2, executive power. You got to know Youngstown. You got to know about appointments. You have to know about executive privilege. You have to know about executive uh, immunity. Um, if you if you know that stuff, you're in pretty good shape. And uh, so we'll we'll call that a wrap for this video, and be back to talk about dormant commerce. Now we're shifting um, in just a little while.